of great joy, which shall be to all people. Sweet hymns of a joy, in grateful chorus raise we, let all within For unto you is born this day, in the city of David, a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. This shall be a sign unto you. Ye shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. I love Christmas. I love Christmas. Does anybody else like Christmas? Amen. Amen. You know, it's the only time of year that we actually focus on the birth of Jesus. In January or February, March, April, May, you go through all the months in the year, and we don't talk about the birth of Christ at all. We don't even fo focus on it. Think about it. So I'm excited about Christmas, and I'm thankful. We're going to be in the uh, first chapter of the, in the book of the good Dr. Luke. Good Dr. Luke. Once you find yourself there, we're going to jump over to two real quick. I want to read a few passages of scripture to memorialize the, the day that we celebrate the birth of Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 2 verse 1 
says, And it came to pass in those days that there went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, everyone in his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth unto Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should deliver. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flocks by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Amen. <laughs> God himself entered into our world. <laughs> Isn't that awesome? Gives me goosebumps just to think about it. I, uh, I'm excited that the Lord came and saved us. I'm excited that the Lord came and identified with us. I'm excited uh, that, that, that the Lord entered in even the way that he did. It was prophesied that he would come in by way of a virgin. Um, I don't know if most people know this. Obviously, Joseph was not his biological father. And the lineage of David, although it's mentioned here, did not transcend into the Savior, which means that Mary had to have been of that lineage as well. And when you study Scripture, as I know you do, you'll find out that that is, in fact, the facts. She was. Now, as I was... Uh, just preparing for the season, preparing for, for uh, even for this message. I started uh, going online and was looking at some of the things that people were saying about Christmas. And I was very sad when I found out that there are a lot of Christians that want Jesus out of Christmas. I mean, I remember when there was a campaign taking Christ out of Christmas, and it was coming from the atheists. And we were... You know, we were uh, strong in our voice and saying, no, the nativity will go up. But yet, it's been attacked. I've watched uh, uh, news reports of schools that are no longer allowing the candy canes to be handed out because it's in the shape of a J for Jesus. That the, uh, the principal would even say that it's not acceptable because... It's a J for Jesus, and the red stripe represents the blood of Christ, and the white is the purity of his nature. I was thinking, well, preach it, lady. <laughs> she knows the truth. Now, that wasn't its origin. But I love that she knew that that's what we see it as. Amen? As believers, followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. I saw attacks on Christmas and how it was the worship of Tammuz, uh, that it was the worship of some pagan ritual. And uh, I got to thinking, um, oh, and then Christians beating up other Christians over, over celebrating the birth of Jesus on December 25th. Now, I don't know when they celebrate Jesus. They say that they do, but all I heard was clanging cymbals in their words because it lacked what? Love. Love. I love Jesus. Amen? Amen? I hope you do too. I love the fact that the word of God, I have, uh, have found out that it is the inerrant word of the living God that has been handed down to us through the power of his Holy Spirit, and it can be trusted. You can lean upon every word, even if you don't understand. There was a time where I didn't understand, couldn't put two and two together. I could just read the red letters and try to grasp what Jesus was saying. Now I'm, I'm thankful that we grow and we mature and we figure out that, uh, that it all connects. It's all perfect. So how is it that at Christmas time we come together and we entered into a time of worship today? I don't know about you, but I did. 
Well, I was worshiping the fact that God himself, who transcends all time, entered into the time continuum by way of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, just like he prophesied, free from sin, lived under the law, the Bible says, and lived the law and paid the penalty for our sins because we couldn't. I'm just saying, that's amazing. We love him, why? Because he first loved us. That's amazing. It's amazing. As I was studying through this, I, I want to, uh, to focus on December 25th. Um, I will never stop celebrating the birth of Jesus on December 25th. I just won't. It's not going to happen. I don't think that we should throw it away because some pagans came together and took that day. If we get that attitude, then any pagan, any atheist can pick any day of any year at any time and all of a sudden usurp what is holy and what is right and what is worshipful and we'll find ourselves where we'll maybe we'll get a day where we can worship. How would you like to go back to those times? I see them in Scripture, not allowed to worship. Daniel, pretty amazingly, said, no, I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'm going to do it. I'll share with you this one thing. The Magi that came from the east probably came out of uh, uh, Babylon. They, they came out of uh, Babylonia. How did they know? Now, these, these are astrologists, astronomers, if you will. These are ones that were looking to the stars, and, and at that time, maybe the constellations lined up, but something miraculous happened, and there was a star that formed in the heavens, and they knew that the king of the Jews was being born. Now, how did these pagans know that? You want to know how they knew? Because there was a man that I just mentioned. His name was Daniel. Remember, he spent time there, and he was lifted to the highest place, and he taught them back then what the Word of God said when it wasn't popular, when it wasn't popular. We're living in a day today where all of a sudden Christmas, Jesus, isn't popular. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to preach Jesus until they kill me. Lord, amen? amen. <laughs> or the Lord comes and gets me. <laughs> I'm looking forward to that. I'm not looking forward to somebody killing me over, over preaching the gospel. But here's an amazing thing about the gospel. The gospel is a gospel of love. You're never going to have to be concerned about me coming up to you with bombs strapped to my body so that I can get to heaven. I'm going to kill you. It's not what Christianity is about. Christianity is about love. Now, these folks that are out there and, and they want to, to live under the law or at least live a legalistic uh, relationship with Jesus come against even their own vehemently tearing and ripping away at the very fabric of what Christ has created, his church. His church. I don't want to be a part of that. I think that, uh, that they need love. I think that they need to mature in Christ. But I don't think that we need to walk away from something that's been established, at least here in America and even over the world. In Pakistan, guess what our brothers and sisters are doing? They're doing exactly what we're doing. We're talking about the birth of Jesus. Now, when you study this through, and here's a, here's a neat thing in, in Luke, and here's something awesome about Dr. Luke. Let's call him Dr. Luke for a second, because being a doctor, he analyzes things, and then he puts together a, 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 a diagnosis and, and makes sure that, that we're not just addressing a symptom, but that we're going to the root cause, and we're finding out why that's happening, and this is his mindset. So when he puts together this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's taking the facts that he knows and he's laying them out in this systematic way so that we can understand. Isn't that awesome? I love how he uses all folks, all folks. Um, but here in the first chapter of Luke, I want to read a few passages of scripture. I, I may actually finish, no, won't finish the chapter, that's long. <laughs> but I want to read some things that we're going to, that we're going to hit on. And then I'm going to take the time and I'm going to go ahead and, and, and uh, set this up. I want you to come up here and I want you to share your testimony 
of what the birth of Jesus Christ means to you. See, we can talk a lot about what the cross means to us, amen, and what the resurrection means to us, and what the walk in the Spirit, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, is. But what of the birth of Christ? What about that miraculous event that took place where all the prophecies were being fulfilled in that moment, but God himself stepped off of the throne and entered into a stable from all of the glory of heaven, stepped down and was born as a baby in a manger. <laughs> That's amazing, isn't it? What does that mean to you? Think about that. Think about that just for a moment. So let me read this. Uh, chapter 1, Luke, verse 5, says, There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judah, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abiah, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And there were both, uh, they were both righteous before God, listen to this, walking in the commandments and ordinance of the Lord, blameless. The good folks, Amen. And they had no child. I imagine that they prayed for a child, but it didn't happen. They're okay, whatever God wills. Because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. They passed the time. They said, the Lord didn't give us a child. We're okay with that. We're going to serve him blameless. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, which is Abiah, according to the custom of the priest's office, uh, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him, being uh, appeared unto Zacharias, an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. Wow. First of all. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled and fear fell upon him, rightly so. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard. And thy, See, they're praying, and they're okay with whatever God had. And, and, and the angel says, Thy prayer was heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth, for he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink, and he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall be turned to the Lord their God, and he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, uh, uh, hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a couple, a people prepared for the Lord. And Zacharias said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife is stricken in years. And the angel answered and said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of God. Whoo! And am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not be able to speak, until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zacharias, and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. And when he came out, he could not speak unto them. And they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them, but remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministry, uh, administration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. And after those days, however many days those were, his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in the days wherein... He looked upon me to take away my reproach among men. And in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent from God unto the city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. And the virgin, virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came unto her and said, Hail, thou art highly favored. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. And when she saw him, she was troubled at his saying, and cast in her mind what manner of salutation this should be. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and his name shall be Jesus. 
shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Ooh, amen. <laughs> then said Mary unto the angel, how shall this be? Not how can this be, but how shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon you, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she hath also conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month with her who was called barren. Amen? Now, we haven't gotten over here to what we read in the birth of Christ, but we're here in this amazing thing. This is where it began, right here. So, um, I could make this long. I was talking with Brother AJ yesterday about uh, we could go into great detail. And I think I, I spent time last year doing that, possibly uh, going into detail. But I want to share just a couple of things with you because this is why I'm never going to stop celebrating Christmas. I don't care if the whole world turns against Christ, turns against Christmas. I don't care if the U.S. government bans it at some point like the malls and the schools have already started. But I'm telling you right now, I'm going to worship the fact that God entered in to save us. Amen. He came here to us to save us. Hallelujah. Woo. I'm going to start preaching here in a minute. <laughs> Amen. So in this passage of scripture that we finished on, verse 36, it says, and this is the sixth month with her who is called barren. So we know that John was born six months before Jesus. Amen. Now, I think that uh, December 25th is a very significant date. And I don't think it's by accident that the pagans decided that they're going to start worshiping the sun god Tammuz on that day. I think that it was something that, the, that Satan, when you go to the spiritual aspect of things, Satan knew what it signified and, and, uh, and basically uh, influenced men who did not have God, they did not have the Holy Spirit, to initiate a day, and I think he used the Catholic Church in many ways and may still do that in many ways. I'm not saying that there aren't saved people in the Catholic Church. I don't know that all of you are saved that are here today. I know that, uh, that the Lord knows, and I know that our job is to plant seeds, amen? amen, and to water those seeds, and God gives the increase. God gives the increase. So this is six months. Now, with all of this, I, I want to share with you that, uh, that, that when Zacharias was in the temple, his service was established by David, and they were broken up into 24 different sessions that they had. The, the, the session of Abiah was at a certain time. It was in the eighth week after the new year, and this would have placed Zachariah's service in the temple around June, around June, mid-June, it ended, and then he went home to his wife after hearing these things and knew that they were going to have a child because I'm telling you right now, when you see an angel standing next to the altar that tells you these things, you just take it for granted that it's going to happen. Amen? So he goes home and he can't speak. And it says after those days, and we don't know how many days, it was probably just a few days. I don't know if you've spent any time away from, 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 your, uh, from your spouse, but... Um, Usually you love one another. And so this, this happens and, and it says in verse 24 of Luke chapter 1, And after those days his wife Elizabeth conceived and hid herself for five months, saying, Thus hath the Lord dealt with me in these days where and looked upon me and, and taken away my reproach among men. Because not having children was an issue. I mean, it looked like something was broken. And for her it did seem that way and she was okay with that. But she's now conceiving. Now, we know that, uh, that six months later, the angel Gabriel, presumably the messenger, talked with Mary, right? Most people, as I'm looking in, 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 in some of the, the, the commentaries, and, 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 and obviously the internet has a lot of information, but a lot of people that are upset with Christmas are angry because they believe that Jesus was born during the Feast of Tabernacles. 
God with us. His name will be Emmanuel, which means God with us. And God came and dwelt among us in the flesh. Amen. The word became flesh. And so I'm, I'm not upset with them at all. Listen, let's serve Jesus. What's that? What is the interesting part of Jews actually believe that the uh, uh, that child's birthday is the date of conception, not necessarily the date that they were physically born on the earth. So you Man, I'm trying to make this dramatic here. Don't <laughs> mess it up. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> I love it. I love it because that's exactly the point that's being made. But why don't we just worship the Lord from the end of September until the end of December? Oh, let's do that. That's good. All year, every day, worshiping the Lord as if it was the, the moment where he entered in and said, I'm here to save you. Amen? That's, that's what we want to get to. That's what we want to get to. I want to look at this because that is so true that the Jews believe that it happens at conception. And so did we for a long time until they decided to start aborting babies because it was uh, inconvenient to raise a child. And now somehow December 25th has been under attack. But I'm thinking that, that children in the womb have been under attack for a long time. I mean, if you grow up and you don't know the Lord, you say whatever society says is okay and the laws tell you that it's fine, you believe that. Now, your conscience may, may, uh, may, may uh, contradict what they say, but it's still okay. So, so many people today are actually, unfortunately, aborting their children at the altar of selfishness instead of raising up a child. I thought it was so amazing. Well, you know, we can't afford this baby, so we're going to go ahead and terminate the pregnancy. You know, it's for their own good. No, 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 no. It's not for their own good. It's a very selfish approach. Believe me, it's a very selfish approach. Conception is under attack in our nation. And I think what we're seeing here, even as December 25th, we're seeing that conception of Jesus Christ is what's being masked and covered. Now, if the birth of Christ is in late September at the Feast of Tabernacles, amen. Worship him then. But of days and seasons, we shouldn't be attacking one another over those things. As a matter of fact, I read a commentary that said that uh, if it's, if it's uh, biblical doctrine, there needs to be unity. Biblical doctrine, there needs to be unity. If there's some ambiguity, uh, ambiguity uh, as far as the, the uh, definitive nature of that doctrine, then there should be liberty. Be understanding with one another. And for the love of Christ, uncompromising. Love should cover all. Amen? Amen? We shouldn't be arguing and getting all upset with each other over December 25th. I know people that, that don't, uh, don't, don't celebrate Christmas. Uh, they're, they love the Lord, but they will not celebrate Christmas because they spent too much time on the internet watching YouTube and they put together some good stuff out there. But I'm telling you, Satan understands the scriptures and he can, he can tear it up very quickly and reference passages of scripture that talk about how we're not supposed to worship Christmas trees. I watched this one deal and talked about a passage of scripture that we have where it's really talking about idols carved out of wood that are covered in silver and gold. And yet people think that, that, that we're worshiping Christmas trees. Now, I don't know about you, but have you ever gone to your house and worship the Christmas tree? Ever? Me neither. And if you get a gift out from underneath it, and it looks like this. Is this you worshiping the tree as you're getting the gift out for the, for the kiddo? No, it's not. Yeah, I, I used to curse the Christmas tree because the lights broke and I had to replace it. <laughs> These lights, they're decorations in celebration, and it's okay. It's not something, I mean, we can get you. I heard this deal about Nimrod. I'm not even going to go into the details that they described about that deal. Uh, perverted. Perverted. It's a tree. It's pretty. As a matter of fact, I, w I would love for that to be all year round. I don't know what we do in January. Just take it all down and just have nothing. I like the lights. I think it looks beautiful. 
And the season is a season of love and joy. Amen? Amen. 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 So here's what I, here, I, I, I want to I share with you about December 25th. If in June was the order of, uh, of Abiah and Zacharias went home for a small season and conceived and six months later Gabriel shows up and talks with Mary, then we're looking at the end of June, July, August, September, October, November, December. The end of December is the conception of Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit. And when you take that nine months, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, the end of September is the Feast of Tabernacles. I'm telling you what, the Word of God is amazing. <laughs> it is so accurate and so awesome that we celebrate the conception of Christ. And that truly is the beginning of our new birth, amen, when God entered in. And so why is Satan convincing so many to cover up the fact that conception of Jesus Christ is amazing, is amazing. You know why? Because salvation comes through no other name but the name of Jesus. 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 Amen. Now I want to take the time and I want to share the pulpit with a few of you, as many of you as you'd like. But even hearing that, what does the birth, the conception of Jesus Christ mean to you? I think I've shared what it means to me. But what does it mean to you? You love the Lord. Believers. Want to follow him in the spirit. Many people are attacking Christmas. Saying that it's wrong. Friends of yours maybe. You want to get irritated with them. And try to show them what the truth is. But what does it mean to you? Because I'm telling you right now. It's real hard to argue with a person's testimony. Do you have a testimony? That you want to give? Amen. Dale, is this okay? I'm going to sit down for a moment, allow the Holy Spirit to move in you and, and give testimony for a moment. For me, get ready, please, right away. Let's not waste time. Amen. Why don't you go ahead and come up right next to me. And then somebody after him and somebody after him. What it means to me is this. I'm taken back to a mission trip when I was in Siliguri, India. And 40 Muslims and Hindus received Christ in the time that we were there for two weeks. That's a lot. And yet, normally, I'm used to seeing over 2,000 people receive Christ in a 10-day mission trip. Um, so 40 Muslims and Hindus. The day we were leaving, a monsoon blew in and it shut down the airport. So they had to put everybody in a hotel. And uh, on the way to the hotel, I'm sitting in the front seat of this taxi. The driver is about 21 years old. And there's a plastic thing on the dashboard bouncing back and forth, kind of like a bobblehead or something. Or you've seen those Hawaiian dancers on the dashboard. It's kind of like that, but it wasn't. And I said, what is that? And the driver said, oh, that is a god. They have thousands of gods in India. They worship almost everything, anything and everything. Things carved of wood, of stone, glass, plastic. I said, you pray to that? He said, yes. I said, in what situation do you pray to that? He said, I don't know. I said, well, when you pray to that, does it hear you? He said, no. I said, so it doesn't hear you, so does it respond to you? He said, no. And I said, how would you like to hear about a God who is alive, not made by hands, and you pray to this same God in any situation, and he always responds. Doesn't he? He always responds. He either says yes or no or wait. Yes, but wait. That's the one we don't like, right? That's the answer we don't like. But he always, how would you like to hear about this God who is alive, and you can pray to him, and he hears you, and he responds? He said yes. So he came into our hotel, 
and I bought him a Coca-Cola, told him about the Lord, opened the Bible, we read scripture, and he received Christ that night. He was number 41 to receive Christ that week, and God loves one person so much, he'll shut down an entire airport and inconvenience an entire flight, several flights for one soul. That's what Jesus means to me. He loves one soul. You think he just loves you in mass. He doesn't. He loves you individually. And I've seen him shut down entire airports and inconvenience hundreds and thousands of, f of travelers for one soul. That's what it means to me. Amen. Um, so the birth of Christ means um, an expression of love to me. Um, and we talk a lot about expression. And uh, my entire life before Christ, I was trying to figure out what it meant um, to express myself to others and then receive expression from other people. And none of it ever made sense before him. And so that's something that means a lot to me and can probably apply to everyone sitting in this room when you realize um, or see what it means to receive love um, in the ultimate form of an expression. And for him to do that for his creation shows me something. Um, it shows me that uh, he's not he, he's he's not uh, he's not careless and uh, he truly loves us and um, I needed that peace uh, of love to be able to share with others too so I can express myself to others um, because uh, in and of myself it's impossible for me to express myself the way um, he wants me to express myself so in that the birth of Christ to me is a miracle number one so it started with that miracle and then it started uh, something beautiful in everyone here as far as uh, an expression um, so if I look at it in that sense of an art form and something that he's creating from our death to me it uh it sheds some new light on uh, on his birth, so praise God. Uh, I used to be in the Catholic Church. I was born and raised a Catholic, and uh, the lie was a birth was a, a new person. So I, I thought of it as a new Jesus as a new person that was born, and that was my wrong definition of it. Um, Emmanuel is God with us and when I grew spiritually it linked me to uh, ma well, the, the man in the tombs that Jesus was coming after uh, he crossed he, went, he was on the boat with the apostles and went to, the, to find that man in the tombs and casted out those uh, legion actually a bunch of demons or devils so the birth of Jesus Christ is not a birth in a secular world to me. It's he's coming for you. We are that man at tomb. He's coming for me. He came for you, for me, for everyone. He came for us. That's the, the, that's the soldier. He came for us. And that's what it meant for me. You know, uh, there's all kinds of religions in the world. And there's all these gods, you know, Hindus have, I think I've heard like six million gods or whatever. And there's, there's all these other things, but all of these gods are separate. They're out there somewhere and, you know, they're holy and you have to worship them, but they're somehow separate. And what Jesus birth did was made him one of us. He be, he was born from a woman just like we are. No different, except that God was the Father. And, uh, and the reason he came is to suffer in our place. And when I think of all the horrific things that I think uh, that people do, you think, you know, pedophilia and murder and, and mass murder and, 
and not just those things, but they're just horrific things that I don't even want to think about. And, and you think about how angry you get about those sins, and our anger doesn't hold a candle to how God feels about that. And can you imagine the kind of suffering that Jesus went through in our place to cover all of those sins and what he did for us? Uh, you know, he's not some God that's out there somewhere separate from us. He became one of us. And he suffered in our place so we could be with him and we wouldn't have to suffer that, that punishment for that sin. I mean, God is holy and he requires an answer for all those sins. And he will. He will get justice, absolute, complete justice. But Jesus took that justice for us. And that is something that I will never stop being thankful for. Hello, good morning. Um, I just wanted to share with you guys, uh, I had a dream about three, four days ago, <clears throat> it was this week, and um, uh, I'll just go over some of the details that kind of stood out from that dream, and I'll, and I'll come to my conclusion of the dream too. So <clears throat> in this dream, um, it felt so real. I was literally in another place. I could feel, uh, you know, the temperature of the weather, the wind. Uh, you look up at the sky and it's, I mean, it, you were there, I was there. And um, and so in this dream, I just, um, I was I was casting out demons. And, and um, I've had a few of these dreams before where I walk into just, a lonely home and I'm looking in there and it's just dark and I see tables and chairs and they just kind of throw themselves against the walls but I'm not afraid because I know who's in me and I'm conscious of the power that God has and I'm conscious of his power and so I don't know if you guys have seen these types of movies where there's like a wizard and he has this his voice like you shall not well that was my voice and in casting out these demons I was like in the name of Jesus this authority was just it was it was it was just something in me in this dream um, at the same time while I was casting out these demons uh, there were two lights coming out of me and I, it was just like they were just coming out out of me like this uh, but I don't know the significance of the lights. I just know that they were there, and I was casting out some just random people that had these that were possessed, and I was casting out the demons. And as I was doing that, I looked up towards the sky, and and the sky started turning like this bluish dark color, uh, just dark. It was it was stormy now, and it was lightning coming out, and then you can hear the sirens, the sirens of the world, you know, when there's war. And um, and when that happened, um, there were just it just got more fantasy after that. It there were just like these giant creatures coming out of under the ground. So um, what I'm trying to say is that I think that I've had a few of these dreams, but they were so real. I was felt like I was really really there. And so when I think about dreams, I think about during the times when even Joseph had a dream like this, where an angel spoke to him. Um, so my conclusion of this dream was, think, I was thinking that that the Holy Spirit is, is a part of God that we don't really think about most of the time. And because we fully don't understand him. But I have, I've had a few encounters where the Holy Spirit did visit me, and um, I, I hear a lot of people in church say, oh, the Holy Spirit tells me to do this, this, and this. I believe that, but the Holy Spirit speaks to us, to everyone differently, individually, and so what I understood from the, from, from the dream was that the Holy Spirit is so real, like, um, 
we don't understand or comprehend him, but he's 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 like um, just think of this when when the in in the times of the of the 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 Jewish temples when Jesus came to preach the word of God to them uh, and, and tell them these new prophecies these people didn't believe him they didn't believe him because hey we only worship God we don't worship a son we don't know of that I mean there's supposedly one but he's not here we don't understand that we know there's a son but we don't understand it so in the same way, we're living in this time 2,000 years after where Jesus said it himself 2,000 years ago, I'm going to send you a counselor and a guider who's going to guide you. We understand that it's the Holy Spirit, but we fully don't understand him. And I truly believe that the Holy Spirit is like our Messiah in this time. He's our, he's our counselor and he is our guider. And we have to learn to worship him as well. And because he is a part of the um, the three in one, right? So I believe that that the Holy Spirit visited me that night in this dream, and He's telling us that we need to be conscious and ready for His coming. I don't know and understand it, but I wanted to share it with you guys because it 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 was like it was like when you're when you're eating something and then you still have the aftertaste you were just sucked back right into reality and my reality was you know it was it was like I was literally transferred from one world to another but I just wanted to share it with you guys because I, I just believe that this is this is uh, how this how um, how the Lord spoke to me Bless the Lord for this place and all oh, my brothers and sisters. I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful to God for his birth, his resurrection, the suffering he did for us. He did die for the whole world, as we all know. But he also died for us personally. Each one of us have had the experience of the powerful working of the Holy Spirit in us and for us. And he dwells within us. It's so personal, so beautiful, that he would reach down to, to each one of us and be personal, be a friend, be our helper. He is everything we need or could ever want. And I'm so thankful. Yes. One of the things that... Uh, always fascinates me is how God has his finger and his needle of, of life running through time all the way through from Genesis to Revelation at some point in time when we get to see him again. But one thing that always really just kind of puts me in a state of awe is how he sees everything. And not only is he outside of time, and I think we had this conversation at one point, but when you're Interesting. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Next door. <laughs> but <laughs> so uh, when you think of the, the the whole point about Genesis, and in Genesis, you know, when the fall came in chapter three, and then you look at everything that took place up until. Jesus is born, all of the things that took place, you see Daniel we talked about, you know, we, you see um, Isaiah, and, and Isaiah paints this beautiful picture of the Messiah in chapter 53, but every little thing, every little weaving, he steps, he, first off, he's, he's in, he's, he's outside of time, the sin, the fall occurs, time begins, and this, 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 this statement he makes when he tells Adam and Eve that what he will do and he sees into the future where he starts the redemption process. But all through that, he paints pictures so that we can understand them. And we never really, people just can't grasp it because we don't have the help. And he realizes that. So when Jesus comes and the Holy Spirit is given to us, our eyes are open, right? 
And we see that we go back then, we can look at Isaiah, we can look at, we can look at Daniel, we can look at Joel, we can look at all the prophets and all the things that they said. And they were basically foretelling all of what we are seeing today. But going back to this and seeing that it took Jesus to come, to open our eyes, it took him to die and to give Holy Spirit to us to live, that to me is what this whole season's about. It's about God piercing that veil of eternity and putting, putting his finger in our hearts and saying, I want you there. And does that to each one of us. Amen. It was a while back, uh, uh, 1977, when I, uh, after cursing my mom, using every F word there was, and feeling so ashamed, I ran down the street to this church, and I just fell on my knees outside the church. And I said, uh, God, if you're real, you got to show it to me now, because I, I can't make it on my own. Anyway, uh, in my senior year of high school, you know, I accepted the Lord, and uh, shortly after that, I was uh, baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues and all that. I was in a middle of revival and it was a charismatic church and and shortly after that I like Sergio I started getting dreams and the first dream I ever had I was driving <laughs> and I crashed and I died and the very next moment I I see this beautiful panorama of, of a hillside, and suddenly there appeared uh, thousands of people uh, dressed in white, and they were approaching me and welcoming me. And in an instant later, I I was in the presence of God, sitting on a throne, and I can't see him because the lights are just emanating from him, and so glorious, and I'm feeling so ashamed because I, I know I'm not holy. And I fall to my knees and I, and I can't even look at him. And while I was kneeling there before him, uh, someone came behind me and placed a crown on my head. And I took that crown and I just threw it at the foot of the throne is I am not worthy. Yes. I never read the Bible before this. I didn't know who Jesus was, but I, I never heard of Jesus. And then in the very next scene, it just lasted a moment, but I see the heavenly choir and the presence of God was just so, I can't, exp I can't explain it. Just in that few notes I heard, and that has always given me a love for music and stuff. Anyway, a few years ago, I can't tell you exactly when because I don't document anything. It was before I came here to Texas, but uh, I walked into this room. I didn't know what it was, and there was a room within that larger room and it was full of chairs, and it was about there were people in it, and it was half empty. But I knew it was a church, although there were no crosses or stained glass or anything. It was just a room. And as they started worshiping, the glory of God fell. And the presence of God was so powerful, you could barely stand. And it went beyond the room, and it was... People outside the building could sense it. There was something powerful and glorious happening in there. And I am certain that is where God is going to bring us. This is that room. And 
when we come to church, if your heart is prepared and you say, I am glad to be going to the house of the Lord, I am ready and my heart is prepared to meet with the one who loves me, who wants to have communion with me. And his presence will be, it will transform you. And as this world grows darker and more evil, and you can see how Satan knows he's, the time is short, he's launching an all-out attack against this nation, we as the remnant has to rise equally in power and glory and know that at the name of Jesus, you know, demons have to flee. We don't back down. We, can, we, we, can, we, we cannot sit on the sidelines and say, oh, I hope uh, Trump does well and make America great. We can't do that. We're not spectators. We need to be on our knees. If his people will humble themselves and pray, I believe we're going to see some mighty, powerful things within this church. We're going to lay hands on people, and they will be healed. They will be delivered, and people are going to be drawn to this place. This is the God's will for this church. Come on, praise the Lord one more time. That was powerful. Come on, praise him. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? We've had tastes of that in this room. We've had people healed and delivered, set free. We've had tastes of that. But it needs to be the norm and not the exceptions. Amen? Amen. I want to uh, just piggyback on that because uh, I have the privilege of, uh, of looking at you <laughs> while we worship. And believe it or not, the Holy Spirit leads me to lead the worship based on what I see in you. So... Uh, I see the glory of God on many of you during the worship week after week. Um, mm -hmm. And when I see that, then the Lord says, okay, I'm doing something right here, AJ. Don't, don't go to the next song. Yeah. Matter of fact, repeat that. You notice sometimes we'll repeat something several times. That's happening because of you. The Holy Spirit is showing me that he's ministering to you and you're responding to that. And so I have to follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So believe it or not, Based on what I see on your faces, the glory on your faces, the brokenness in your faces, you're actually leading the worship mm. because the Lord is. Uh, so you see, you have a huge yes. part in it. Wow. If I had a bunch of empty chairs, we wouldn't do much worship. Mm. I would personally worship, but I do that all the time. But believe it or not, how the Holy Spirit is touching you and leading you uh, really leads our worship. And so... Uh, I love that, Brother Orlando. We need to show up expecting That's right. the Holy Spirit to yeah. fall in this place. Yeah. Yeah. In other words, we need to start being intentional. Intentional to show up on time. Intentional yeah. to invite somebody else and not keep this secret of Jesus to ourselves. Fill this room. Fill this room with God's people and then we'll fill the room with God's praises. Mm. Amen? Amen. Amen. Anybody else believe that? Just me? Amen. Amen. Praise and his the presence. Lord. Is there anybody else who wants to testify what Christmas means to them, what Jesus means to them? I don't want to leave anybody out. Cole, will you get that top, uh, that stack of manila envelopes for me? That top stack. There you go. There you go. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Going once, going twice. Thank you, Pastor, for sharing Amen. this time with us. Amen. Uh, last year, I gave away these certificates. Some of you have them. Some of you lost them. Some of you were not here and did not get one. We have more to give to you today. I won't tell you a funny story, but let me read this to you. <clears throat> it's the certificate of birth. This certifies that Jesus was born in the year 4 BC at a stable located in Bethlehem of Judea. The name of the divine father was God. The name of the human mother was Mary. Residence, Nazareth. Luke 2.11 For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. 
At the bottom it says, the nation of Israel. Attendant at conception, the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. So I went and I had these copies made for you all. And the lady behind the counter at the, at the uh, office max, I said, I need 50 copies of this. So she said, oh, how cute. Look at those footprints. That's all she saw <laughs> was the first footprint. And she said, uh, how many copies? I said, 50. And so she went and made 50 copies and brought it back. And I looked at them. I said, those are good. She said, and, and, and uh, congratulations. <laughs> I said, for what? She says, is this your first? I said, you did not read that, did you? And she says, no, I didn't. I said, this is the birth certificate of Jesus. She says, actually, talk about stereotyping. I'm Hispanic, right? So she still didn't get it. She goes, certificate of birth that certifies that Jesus. <laughs> Isn't that funny? That's hilarious. That actually happened. I'm not making it up. And uh, I said, you didn't read this. I said, down here it says, uh, attendant at conception, the Holy Spirit. I was not there when that happened. The Holy Spirit was. I said, that was the Holy Spirit that was there at the birth of Jesus. Amen? She hey. goes, amen. Yeah, that's good. <laughs> you know, kind of looked a little around a little bit. So... God is good to us. Amen? Amen. All Let's the time. you help me. I want to make sure everybody gets one of these. If you don't want one, that's fine. If you already have yours, that's fine. If you want another one, that's fine. I brought some manila envelopes to protect them because they could easily get bent. Um, and one more thing before you hand them out. I want to encourage you to do something very elaborate. We have ours at home in the most ornate, elaborate, gold frame that we could find because it's worth it. Amen? Amen. It's worth it, right? It's Jesus. And every year, this is like the centerpiece of our home during the season, that ornate frame with this in there. So, you know, thrift stores or go get yourself a brand new one and spend a fortune on it. I encourage you to frame those and make a big deal of it every year. Uh, the birth of Jesus. Amen. Pastor. Amen. Well, that, uh, that's definitely a conversation piece at the home or at the office. I think I'm going to put mine in the office. The one thing I do like about that is it's not an electronic copy that falls apart when you actually try to open it up like I've seen before. <laughs> Maybe you guys didn't get that. That's okay. Obama's birth certificate fell apart when they tried to open it up electronically. Anyway, it's good. I think that uh, the blessing of this day has just been that we've come to a thin place. We've had some laughs. We've looked at scripture. We have uh, studied and understood. We've heard testimonies. We've worshiped the Lord. And uh, Brother Orlando uh, said it best that, that uh, when we come together, it's a place where God wants to commune with us. Amen. And uh, he entered in and came after us, like Lester said. He entered into the time continuum and, and uh, just altered my life. I don't know about yours. One of the things that's, that blesses me is that Jesus walked the walk that I couldn't walk. I didn't even know I was supposed to walk it at one point in time. But then he came and told me that he did it for me. Came and saved me, saved my marriage, called me to be a shepherd of his people. And this is uh, a common area where we come together, God's people. And I was thinking today, this morning, I thought how blessed I am to have my wife in my life. And uh, I thought... Lord, thank you. I couldn't imagine, you know, what it would be like without her. And it was just, uh, just thinking about it. But I could not imagine what it would be like without Jesus. Because it was only Jesus that made me realize how much I love my wife. 
So today we're going to commune with the Lord and remember the work that He did on the cross. That birth that took place, 33 and a half years that He walked in our place, suffered what we were supposed to suffer. He lived the life that we were supposed to live and then suffered the death we were supposed to die. He did that all for us. We're going to remember him as Lester and, and Lamb pass out the elements. The place that we've come to, I think, is a thin place. I'm thankful where the presence of the Lord is, feels like he's just on the other side of, of what we see. I've shared this before of communion in many places. It's closed. If we had a membership, you wouldn't be a part of the communion. I don't believe that that's how it's supposed to be. Some churches, it's open. It doesn't matter who you are. Take it if you like. I believe that the scripture speaks of something close. I'm talking about this thin place where the Lord is so close. It's a close communion. If you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, then partake. If you don't know the Lord as your personal Savior, you can give your life to Him right now. Don't wait. We don't know. I was driving down the road to, earlier this week and I had a big water bottle. It was a smart water. I'm trying to get there. I was drinking it and I couldn't get it because the roof of the car was too low. So I turned it this way and stuck it up through the, the sunroof. I drove off the road started to lose control of the vehicle. I was able to swerve back onto the road and it kind of fishtailed a little bit and I was like, Lord, just like that. We don't even know. Just like that. If that was a creek or something, I wouldn't have even known what happened. I just turned my head for a moment. It happened so fast. Don't wait. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, your personal Savior, don't wait. Please don't wait. We're not even guaranteed that we're going to make it to the restaurant. We're not guaranteed that we're going to make it through the day. It happens so fast, so fast. Lord also tells us that as we take this, let a man examine himself, so, so let him eat of that bread and that drink. He that eats and drinks unworthily eats and drinks this damnation on themselves, not discerning the Lord's body. Take this time just for a moment. Just see where you're at. We come to church, we fellowship. If there's anything in your life, talk with him about it. The most amazing thing about Christ is he takes it, he cleanses us. Now let thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. Mine eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared before the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentile and the glory of thy people Israel. Behold, this child is set for the fall and rising again of many in Israel. Yea, a sword will pierce to thy own soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. <laughs> 